Hey everyone, it's Miss Lopez. Welcome to Chapter 44, Ecological Communities. This is your introduction to ecology for Unit 1. Here are some of the key concepts we're going to go over in the first part of this video. Note that your ecology for Unit 1 is broken up into two separate sections. The first part is covering Chapter 44, where we focus on ecological communities. We're going to look at how species that colonize areas um, persist, in other words, exist in particular areas. Then we're going to look at how communities change over space and time. Then we're going to look at community structure and how that a community structure affects its function, a very common theme we have in AP Biology. Then we're going to look at diversity patterns to provide clues to what determines diversity. And then last, for part one, we're going to talk about community ecology suggests strategies for conser conserving community function. So let's get started by defining and identifying where we are at. We are at a community level. A community is a group of species that occurred together in a geographic area. So if you look at this graph here, we have the different levels of organization going from the largest, which would be the biosphere, then progressively getting more and more focused. Biome, ecosystem, community, which is where we are at, populations, organisms, and then in, in AP biology, we can even go further in more depth by looking at uh, uh, tissue, cells, specific organelles. But in this first video, we are gonna cover interactions at the community level. Now, in order to do that, we are gonna talk a little bit about ecosystems. But our focus is going to be on at the community level for this set of notes for Unit 1. Communities are characterized by species composition, which species they contain, the number of species, and the abundance of each species. These attributes are components of the community structure. We mention here which the, 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 the types of species, the number of species, or the abundance of species, you change that community structure. And if you change that structure, likely those organisms or some organisms are... Local extinctions can occur for many reasons. So what, something that happens to these communities is that you can have organisms disappearing, dying off from that community. And if you change that structure of that community, you change how it functions. In other words, if you change any of the very going to die off, and we call those extinctions. And so these local extinctions can occur because there's some type of inability of the species to tolerate local conditions. So maybe Maybe something has changed. Maybe the amount of food has changed, or maybe the amount of, of habitat and home spaces for these organisms has changed. A resource may be lacking. Maybe this is something like water or food, not enough sunlight. Exclusion by competitors, predators, or pathogens. We're going to talk more about that um, in the second part of this video. Um, and then the population size may just be too small. There's not enough reproduction or there's too much reproduction um, of inbreeding that the genetic diversity goes down and then they're more susceptible to disease or something to that effect. Species composition also changes over time naturally and normally. It's important that you guys understand that all communities are dynamic, meaning that they do change. There are fluctuations. There is an ongoing colonization and local extinction and thus steady turnover in species. Steady turnover means that maybe this month one particular species is um, has an advantage and is doing well and thriving and reproducing, but then in six months it may be a different population. Dispersal deliveries, delivers a constant influx of new individuals to all but the most isolated instances. So we're going to have organisms that are coming into an area, organisms that are leaving the area, and that's going to change the structure of our, of our systems. 
A disturbance is an event that causes a sudden environmental change and can change species composition. Disturbances include volcanic eruptions, wildfires, hurricanes, landslides, landslides, human activities. Some are all aspects, some are all species are wiped out and environmental conditions are changed. Again, you change the structure of it, you change the function. New environments can appear without disturbance. For example, when a glacier melts away, a depression fills with rainwater or mammal deposits or mammal deposits dung. So these are examples of how new environments can suddenly come up even though there really wasn't necessarily a what we describe as a disturbance. Um, species often replace one another in a predictable sequence called succession. Factors that result in successional sequences. Some species are better at colonizing than others. So I want you guys to think about um, if we were talking about different species or comparing them, what kind of characteristics would make one species better at colonizing another than another species would? After a disturbance, environmental change, environmental conditions change with time. After a disturbance, succession often leads to a community that resembles the original one, although that's not always guaranteed. So what you have here are two illustrations. In this case, we have, you can see here, a forest that has been cleared. This is called clear cutting. This is an example of secondary succession. And then down here at the bottom, we have a volcano erupting, and you can see the lava spewing out. This is primary succession. And this is something that students confuse a lot. So I want to make sure you guys understand the difference between the two. In secondary succession, after the disturbance, there is still soil. As a result of having soil and seeds buried and organisms there, secondary succession, the process which we, when that area starts to grow back into the forest that you see here, is going to occur much faster than primary succession. In primary succession, there's no soil left behind. So the ecosystem is going to have a harder time. It's going to take much longer to get back to what it originally was because before you can even get started, you've got to take whatever rock is present, whether it's lava or bedrock, and grind it back into soil. Students typically will answer that primary succession happens first, secondary succession happens second. That is not the definition of primary and secondary succession. So make sure you understand that primary will occur with no soil present, secondary will occur with when soil is present after the disturbance. Each species has a unique niche that determines its function in a community. So once succession has finished, or is, as there's no finish to it, once succession has happened, um, each organism that lives in that community is going to have a particular role that it plays. The concept of the niche has two meanings. The environment where we expect to find the species based on its tolerance to the abiotic conditions. And the second thing you have to take into consideration with the niche is that the biological environment is also important. So are, is it predator, are there any predators present? Is, does it have to compete with other organisms for resources? Is it nocturnal? It, does it, is it active in the day? Um, is it a producer? Is it prey for another predator? All of those things factor into a niche. And many times students like to say that a niche is the role that an organism plays in its environment. Um, that is too broad of an answer. You've got to understand that everything about this organism, where it sleeps, what it eats, um, what time is it active, how it affects the ecosystem, all of that is factored into the niche. The niche refers to a species' functional role in the community. It is largely defined by how it affects other species, what resources it uses and makes it unavailable to other species, what, what it produces that other species can use, whether it affects the physical environment. Ecologists look for broad patterns in the relationship between the structure, community structure and function. 
And one aspect of community structure that influences community function is a concept that is known as species diversity. Species diversity has two components, species richness, which is the number of species in the community, and species evenness, which is the distribution of species abundance. A community of four equally abundant species is more diverse than one in which 75% of the individuals belong to one species and 25% are spread amongst the other three species. So on this next diagram, you can see three different communities of fungi. Each of these communities has 12 members each. However, when you look at how the species are distributed, you'll start to notice some differences. And these differences are helpful, in un in, in, are helpful to us to understand diversity. Community A has different types of mushrooms. It has one, oops, let's do that in a darker color. It has one, two, three different types of mushrooms. Community B and C have similar types as well, but they contain, uh, contain an additional fourth species. So B and C have four different types of mushrooms and community A only has three types of mushrooms. So even though community A, B, and C all contain the same number of individuals, they differ in their species richness. Community A only has three species, while communities B and C have four species. Another thing you might notice is that for community B versus community C, not only do they both have 12 individuals and they have the same species richness, in other words, they have four species, you'll notice that even though they have four species, their, what we call their evenness is different. In other words, in community B, you have several of the different four species in this group but in community C, you have only one of these three species, and then the rest of your population, a majority is made up of this yellow species. So not only do we talk about richness in terms of how many species there are in the community, we also have to factor in evenness when we are talking about diversity. One of the things that scientists found was that they noticed how species could change by location on the planet. In other words, the latitude. Geographic patterns of species diversity shed light on factors that affect diversity. An early naturalist noticed that species richness varies with that latitude. The greatest diversity of many plants and animal groups occurs in the tropics. And this is important to remember because the higher the di biodiversity of an area, the more that ecosystem can withstand changes that occur in that area. So why do the tropics support more species? Tropics have a high abundance of solar energy and therefore high productivity. In other words, a lot of base for the... Um, for the food webs in that area. Variation in habitat structure, so you can also find that as well. In general, the, div the diversity is higher and is in more structurally complex habitats. So the more number of species you have, um, the more stable that environment is going to be, and therefore it's going to persist, it's going to last longer. Species richness also can vary on islands. Species, species richness is greater on larger versus smaller iron, islands and on islands that are near the mainland more than are on distant islands. And so what we're looking at here is this original landmass and several smaller islands that get progressively further away from the island. You'll notice that on island A, the number of different species 
is similar to the number of species on the mainland. Whereas when you get to island B, you'll notice there are fewer species. There's only two. The triangle didn't quite make it this far. And then on island C, it's even further, you'll, or it's even more pronounced. You'll see that there's only one species available. And the reason why is because there has to be migration in some way, shape, or form between the island and the mainland. And so with more frequent migration, you get more of the species that are able to cross um, this body of water. And then the, the further the distance, the harder it's going to be for organisms to be able to cross. And so you get fewer organisms um, on island B, but you can have migration between island A and B. You just don't get it from B to the mainland. And then the same thing with C. From island C to island B, you'll get frequent migration, but from island C back to the mainland, you won't get that frequent migration. I hope you guys found this, these notes helpful to you. Um, this ends part one of the ecology notes for unit one. Make sure to watch part two of the video as well. Thanks for watching.